Um, it's a great honor to join you. I'm based in Johannesburg. Um, it's obviously evening here already, um, but thank you for the opportunity. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is artificial intelligence as it relates to software testing and, and quality management. Um, what I always say when I talk about this topic is that I will most likely leave you with more questions than answers. Um, I always, when I plan a talk, think to myself, what do I want people to leave with when I'm done? If at the end of this talk you realize how our world is changing because of artificial intelligence and new technologies, if you realize how we as a testing and quality management community need to change ourselves and rapidly, and if you realize that it's something to embrace and not to fear, um, and lastly, if you have, uh, if I've left you with some resources, books, and names of people who are practitioners of testing and artificial intelligence, then I think I've been successful. Um, what I have found is that there's not a lot of people out there that are experts or practitioners when it comes to AI and software testing. Um, so just a little bit about myself to set the scene. For about 20 years or so, I was in a, in a sales role or a business development role. For about 10 years, the last uh, decade or so, I worked for software testing consultancies um, uh, with a global customer base. And about two and a half years ago, I joined a bank, a bank that was one of my biggest clients for about eight years. And in my role now, I deal with many of the vendors that I used to either work for or competed with previously. So it's almost like I jumped over the fence. And what's interesting in this role is that a lot of these companies that I've been competing with for 10 years are now my vendors and I'm their client. And it's interesting to see how these software providers, whether they're pure play or part of bigger global consulting firms, how they pitch for business, but especially how they talk about new technology and the likes of robotics and artificial intelligence and cognition. And um, my experience, and I need to stress that this is only my personal experience, is that it, there's a lot of exciting information out there. There are some amazing uh, white papers and research documents, uh, publications. Um, but when it comes to really getting your hands dirty, getting into the trenches, and embarking on this journey of AI as it relates to testing, my view is that a lot of these global vendors are not necessarily able to help you. So to a large extent, we're gonna to have to figure this out ourselves. One of the big challenges we have when it comes to AI as it relates to testing is to what extent the greater organization you're working for or working with have embraced or are planning to embrace this AI journey. There's always a debate, can we as a testing organization, whether it's a TCOE or a, a center of expertise or, or whatever, whatever it is where you work, can you as an organization, a test organization, in your cell or by yourself and isolated, embark on an AI journey to prove to the rest of your organization that AI can work? Or to what extent are you very limited if the rest of your organization are not embracing AI? And I think as a testing organization, there are definitely some things you can do. For one, you have to get yourself ready for the future. You have to get yourself upskilled. You have to uh, become familiar with the terms and technology around AI. But I think if the greater organization you're working for, the greater organization when it comes to the, the whole end-to-end -end SDLC and the business you're working for are not embracing AI, it will be quite difficult for the testing teams on their own to embrace this journey. Lastly, before I get into my slides, um, I often ask people when I do a talk, is how many of you work for a bank or in financial services? And then a whole number of hands go up. And then I say, how many of you work for a software development company with a banking license? And often no hands go up. And then I say, but every one of you who have put up your hands and said you are working in banking should be the same people who put up your hand saying, we actually work for a software development company or a technology company with a banking license. And what I try to illustrate through doing that is to, to say that our world is changing so rapidly. And, and as every one of you listening to me now know, software is what drives every business. And every business has to become essentially a software business, a software driven business. 
who happens to be a bank or who happens to be a telco or, or whatever kind of business they are in. I think that that mindset is aspirational. It doesn't necessarily exist in a lot of the organizations we're working for, but hopefully we can um, kind of bring that change in. Another interesting article I read recently, so I work for a bank and, and you'll see always the bank's top execs and especially the CEO would be people with strong financial backgrounds like chartered accountants. And because of this change where the bank is becoming a technology organization with a banking license, the debate is will the CEOs of the future come from the tech uh, sector or the tech organization, the, the technology organization in the bank? In other words, will the bank CEO of the near future be a technologist and not necessarily a financial person? So that's something very interesting to think about. So just a very little small bit of marketing before I start. If you want to follow my work on the screen, you can see my URL or, or my website, thebusinessoftesting.com. You will see there's a book about artificial intelligence as it relates to software testing. Um, I'm working with some collaborators across the world. It's not been going as fast as I was hoping because we've had European summer holidays. And um, I think for many of you, you will understand when I say these last few months before December is normally crazy before the so-called project freeze. Um, I sometimes feel that the work we should have done in the last 12 months, we're trying to do in the next six weeks. Um, but I really hope to get traction with this book over the next few weeks and months. Um, and as I'll talk about later in, in this presentation, there's not a lot of books out there specifically about testing as it relates to artificial intelligence. Lastly, from a marketing point of view, if you go to my website, I, I try and release a podcast recording um, every week or sometimes twice a week. Um, where I interview testing professionals um, and uh, practitioners from across the globe, asking them about their careers, what they've learned, what they wish they knew when they started. And it's interesting to talk to different people. There are some common themes. For instance, a, a lot of people talk about the fact that they wish they had more technical training when they started off in their testing journey, given where testing is going now and into the future. Um, and another theme that comes out is that I wish I asked more people for questions and that I networked more earlier on in my career. And I think that's what makes a lot of people successful, our ability to reach out to others, our ability to network, our ability to know who to ask questions when we're stuck. Um, and I think you'll be surprised when you reach out to people that, you know, even if it's the so-called big names in our industry, people are normally quite open to respond to your LinkedIn request or message um, or to send you some uh, content um, and to help you via email or even do a call with you and your team. Later on in my presentation, I'm going to give you the names of some people in our industry who are AI and testing practitioners. And I encourage you to follow their work, their blogs, their conference speaking um, posts that I put on, on LinkedIn or SlideShare and to reach out to them as well. All right, so a little disclaimer that I always mention uh, when I do my talks. Um, Everything I say during this talk is my own opinion. It doesn't necessarily represent the organization I'm currently working for or have worked for previously. Um, I was in a global consulting role some years back and, and this was drilled into us. Whenever you are talking and you're not officially representing them, make sure you say that this is my own uh, opinions. Okay, so having done all that, I want to talk to you just briefly on this picture that you're seeing at the moment, a brave new world. Now, for a lot of you, I will be preaching to the choir. A lot of you will know exactly what I'm talking about and will most likely even know more than I do. I don't think we can underestimate how this world of technology is changing and particularly how the world of software quality engineering and testing is changing. Like many of you know, in the past, we were all part of these waterfall projects uh, we were seen as what I call the stepchildren of the SDLC. If you couldn't make it as a developer, then they would always make you a tester. Or if you were on the bench, they would make you a tester because testing was easy. You just use a tool and you click a few buttons. And, and I think a lot of people still today, unfortunately, see testing as almost a secondhand career, especially people who have been in the tech world for 20 or 30 years and are often now leaders and execs in the companies we are working for. And this has been a big frustration for me. A lot of these people are not keeping up with the trends. They are not aware of how 
quality engineering and testing is playing a bigger and bigger role. And the reasons are obvious. We are living in a world where change is rapid and it's just becoming more and more rapid. We are living in a world where we get these news reports of personal data being hacked, you know, Facebook and others. I think the reputation of the companies we are working for is hanging on, on a thin line if there's a tech problem or downtime or something like that. We now have customers who interact with us uh, with the cell phone or the mobile phone in their pocket. Like the bank I work for, the bank you might be working for, in the past our worry could have been that the ATMs are down or internet banking is down uh, or one, just one of these channels are down. But right now, if something is down, it's right there in the hand and in the face of your client. A lot of our clients are the so-called millennials, the younger people who are not necessarily brand conscious or brand loyal. And with the rise of fintechs, it is so easy to switch to another financial services provider. You can literally do it in some instances in a few minutes. So if we think that people will remain our banking clients or our telco clients, um, out of a sense of loyalty, those days are gone. People demand good service when they need it, 24 hours a day. So the world of testing, I think, is changing to a world where we should test the end user's experience. Ultimately, that's what we do. So never mind what tools and frameworks and technologies and whether we are DevOps or Agile or whether, whether it's waterfall, I mean, those things are important. We often forget the context and the reason why we do what we do. We test quality and hopefully end-to-end -end quality of the customer's journey. And that's why I think a lot of organizations are struggling. They still see testing as very siloed, often at the end and often these seemingly unskilled or unsuccessful people, and that's so wrong. Um, I think we're going into a world where, you know, in the past, Hardcore developers would look at testers or would look down on testers. I think we're going into a world where hardcore developers can be enticed into a world of quality engineering, where quality engineers themselves should be hardcore developers. So we're entering this brave new world. We already are in it. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. If you read the World Quality Report, the latest one was released in the last two or three weeks, you know, a good third. 33 or so percent of mature IT budgets are spent on software quality engineering. And I say mature for, for a specific re reason. I think if organizations understand the role of software quality and the, the importance of these software quality practitioners in their organization, they will invest a lot more. They also need to invest in software quality for the reasons I've just mentioned. The fact that if you fail now, you fail the client's experience and you fail in their own hands with the mobile phone that they're holding. In the next few years, that spend could go up to as much as 40 or 45%. So I think we definitely are in a good career. We need to upskill ourselves. We need to um, ensure that we can use the likes of robotics and artificial intelligence to test or to test those systems. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, but from a spend point of view and from an urgency point of view and from a priority point of view, software testing is a good game to be in. So um, I hope you realize that. So one of the first questions I want to ask you is what is your view of artificial intelligence? And again, many of you listening to me now will be very familiar with AI and have been reading books and have been reading articles. Um, but I find a lot of people the first emotion that comes up when you talk about AI are emotions formed by Hollywood movies and, um, and books they might have read where robots take over our world. Um, we all lose our jobs. We've got these robots um, soldiers who start killing everyone. Um, and, you know, that's quite an extreme view. Um, the debate is to what extent that's true, and I'll, I'll get to that now. But just for a moment, when you think about artificial intelligence, what is it that comes up? It could be fear of the unknown. It could be that you've heard about this so much and, and you have no real clue what it's about. That's okay, we're all learning. You might fear, which I think is one of the biggest fears when it comes to this technology, is that we will all end up jobless because computers, oh sorry, robots and, and AI agents will be doing our jobs as software quality engineers. There's already um, 
AI being implemented in military and in warfare. You know, so the so the militarization of or the weaponization of AI is a real thing. It's happening already, and that's a massive concern. But I think the more I've learned about AI, the more I became um, comfortable with it, the more I felt it is. And I think it, the power is in our hands to make sure we are ready to embrace AI. One of the terms that you will read when it comes to this kind of technology is cobotics, not necessarily robotics. So one of the big questions we need to ask as quality engineers is, will AI take over everything we do? And essentially we will become uh, irrelevant and lose our jobs. Or will AI give us the ability to be better at what we do? I think a lot of us, a big part of our job has to do with repetitive, boring kind of tasks. Robotics is um, really the big enemy. If your job is really just about repetitive tasks, typically back office kind of tasks, processing documents and things like that, I think those kind of careers are under a huge threat when it comes to robotics and AI and machine learning. But if you're a skilled quality engineer, technically, as well as um, from an experience point of view, and if we use AI correctly, it could be one of the best things that's ever happened to us. Test faster, to bring our costs down significantly, and to use technologies like machine learning and cognition to do our jobs better. So my personal view is I don't think it's gonna take over our jobs. I think those who have an upskill, those who are not technical testers, those who are not working in a world where you shift left, where you are part of a quality engineering practice, and not just a testing team somewhere at the end, then you should be secure in your job. So just think about if, if your view of AI at the moment is negative or fearful, I want to encourage you to maybe get away from all the Hollywood movies and all the hype and really start reading some of the white papers and um, blogs and, and sources that's out there. It's like many things in life, the more knowledge you get, the less you fear it. We often fear the unknown. So the power is in your hands. There's so much on LinkedIn learning and other learning websites. And if you just YouTube AI, there's so much. And at the end of my talk, and hopefully if time permits, there's about a, a six minute video I want to show you just to kind of stir you up about how our world is changing and how much we ourselves need to embrace this change and learn ourselves. So a little bit about the hype and hysteria. And, you know, between Zuckerberg and um, Musk, and others like them, we get so many different kind of views and opinions about um, artificial intelligence and for that matter, any kind of new technology. So on the one hand, we have to ask ourselves, is this just hype? In other words, is it just a way of making money through conferences? You know, it's AI this and AI that. If you go on Twitter and you search for AI, it's, it's like an avalanche of information and new organizations and and new white papers and new certifications and things like that. Um, or is it hysteria? And at the other extreme is it's something we have to absolutely fear. And I think there's a middle ground. There's definitely a lot of hype. And we need to learn how to see through that hype. And later on, when I talk about terms like robotics and, and artificial intelligence, etc., I'm going to hopefully give you a little bit of ammunition to learn to look through the hype. Uh, a lot of organizations who talk about AI are actually talking about robotics and there's a big difference and I'll, I'll get to that just now. So I think um, it's definitely hype, but it's not just hype. It, there, is, there are some causes for hysteria and fear, but it's not all that it is. There's a, a safe middle ground where we can embrace this technology, it can help us and we can look through all the hype. When you read about artificial intelligence and, and the history, it's been around for about 40 or 50 years already. It's actually not something new. In the past, the technology just couldn't um, embrace the concept of AI. So there's been these two so-called artificial intelligence winters. It's something very interesting to read about, but essentially what happened there is that the hype was so much, the technology wasn't there to accommodate the hype and it died down. So some of the debates that's been going on is, are we currently in a third um, AI winter or, or will a third AI winter hit us? Where the hype is so much, but the technology can't keep up. But I think the consensus is this is not a winter. If you think of cloud technology, you think of where computing power is at the moment, 
then it's definitely something that's real in our lives right now. Arthur, another question I like to ask audiences when I speak on this topic is how many of you have used artificial intelligence today? Normally no one puts up their hands. And then I try and remind them, we all have. If you've used Google Maps or Waze to get to your destination, if you use Shazam to find a song that you heard on the video on the, the radio, um, and, and hundreds of other applications. Yes, it might be AI in a um, primitive form, um, but we are all consumers of artificial intelligence. A lot of the call centers you might call are robots you could be speaking to, natural language processing and things like that. So it's not something in the future, it's here right now. Even though there's a lot of hype, I don't think this hype is so much that technology can't keep up with it. All right. There's a, an amazing website that I would like you to keep in mind, The Visual Capitalist, you can just Google it. They produce these amazing infographics about AI, but about a lot of other things. And I actually find looking at their reports visually appealing. So it's, it's also a nice way to learn. And I'll show you a few screenshots um, that I got from their website. So they talk about 2030, and I wanna remind you, it is not all that very far away that AI will be a $15.7 trillion market. And there's a lot of research and facts behind what they're saying and what a lot of others are saying. Now, the, the, the um, year will change, some would say 2028 or 2032, it's still around the corner. The number 15.7 trillion will, will change somewhat. But I mean, even if it's 10 trillion, even if it's 5 trillion, it's a massive amount of money that's gonna be spent on artificial intelligence. So. One of the quotes is this one, just as a hundred years ago, electricity transformed industry after industry, AI will now do the same. Now, most of us grew up with electricity, even though there are many parts of the world where a lot of people don't have electricity or will never know it. I think for most of us, most of us in this industry, most of us on this call, on this webinar, electricity is a given for us. It's something we've always known. And when we have the odd power failures or blackouts, it's like our lives come to an end. Because if you don't have electricity, I mean, your mobile phone is most likely not working. Well, you can't charge it. The mobile phone tower near your house is most likely down too. So you cut off from the outside world. Your fridge doesn't work. So the food is going bad very soon. Um, I mean, and just not to be connected to the internet in itself is such a scary thing. I think it gives us a lot of paranoia if we can't, access our Facebook feeds and our Twitter feeds and the likes like that. So my son is about four and a half year, years old. AI for him will be like electricity is for me. I cannot imagine a world where it didn't exist. I think that's quite a provocative and interesting quote. The next one says no sector or business is in any way immune from the impact of AI. Don't think this is just relevant to banking or to telcos or to the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, even the most seemingly boring or non-technological organizations will be impacted by artificial intelligence or for that matter, by um, technological advances as a whole. Remember what I said earlier, do you work for a bank or do you work for a technology company with a banking license? Even plumbers or, or uh, construction work, it's all impacted already by technology. Imagine how artificial intelligence, predictive kind of technologies will impact the um, sectors that I've just mentioned. It's difficult for us to imagine it. I mean, if you think of a plumber, how difficult can it be? But imagine a plumber gets a call from a client and by just analyzing their voice and the key words they say, you can maybe already to a certain percentage of accuracy determine through an AI agent what the problem is. It is already possible. Imagine where we will be in five years or so from now. There's an insurance agency that, um, and I can't right now remember their name and I don't have it on my slides. They can to a 30, oh, sorry, to an 82% accuracy predict which of their clients will call them on what day, at what time, about what problem. And that's all about data. And data is something I'll speak about a bit more later on because AI is absolutely um, dependent on data. That's why the, the so-called Internet of Things is such a ripe arena for AI to thrive. Because through these devices, you get masses and masses amounts of data, 
about your clients, their geographical location, their buying habits, how they're using the relevant instruments um, that's connected uh, from an IoT point of view. And a lot of us work in organizations where we have data problems. I'll, I'll get to that just now. But so imagine through your behavior as a client of this insurance company, your buying habits, your profile from a gender point of view, a geographical location, age point of view, your medical history, who knows what. Imagine this 82% accuracy that can predict what you're going to call them about. And this comes back to the cobotics. So it might not necessarily be a, a robotic system or a natural language um, processing system answering your call. It could actually be a human being. But imagine I'm the call center agent. And when I get your call and it appears on my screen, I already know to that kind of a level of accuracy what you are most likely calling me about. And I already have the most probable answer ready for you on the screen. That is incredible. This is that $15.7 trillion number that I spoke about that's um, from this visual capitalist um, website. Look here on the left-hand side, labor productivity improvements of $6.6 .6 trillion. Like with any um, technological advance in the past, there will be massive job losses and there will be a massive amount of jobs created. This happened in the industrial revolution when locomotive trains were still uh, were first introduced. And you can look at the history of technological innovation. Those who do not keep on upskilling themselves, those who don't embrace it will fall away and by the wayside. But there are always opportunities to make millions and millions of dollars for those who are willing to risk and to try and stay ahead of the game. Make sure they're technically capable, make sure they know where the trends are going. So like with the locomotives and a uh, hundred other examples one could mention in the past from the discovery of the wheel up until now, it'll, there will be a massive impact on, on uh, employment rates negatively and positively. And like I mentioned earlier, maybe this is maybe the biggest concern for most organizations and governments. Will this new technology lead to massive job losses, especially in developing economies where the job um, a loss rate is already very high? Hopefully those countries and those governments and companies will embrace this so that we upskill our people to become um, agents who can use artificial intelligence. And you see on the right there the increased consumer demand, demand of $9.1 trillion. I mean, I can't say to you right now how many zeros is in a trillion, but it's a heck of a lot of money. Can you see the opportunity, not just from an entrepreneurial point of view, like I said in the beginning, when we're done with this talk, if I can leave you with the sense that there's a great opportunity for you as a quality engineer to leapfrog in your skills, to keep on learning and to embrace that, this technology, there's a wonderful career ahead of you. Don't be scared of it, embrace it. So then that brings us now to what we do as a craft software testing and quality engineering. Now, I'm speaking about testing and quality engineering as two different things. I think it's two kind of interchangeable terms. Again, I'm preaching to the choir, but let me just quickly touch on that. A lot of us work for organizations where we're still testing. There could be a lot of manual testing. There could be some sort of shift left to automation. But in a lot of organizations, we still deal with legacy systems and old ways of working. A lot of us work in organizations where there's this dual world where there's still a lot of old ways of working and legacy and testing at the end when there's time and budget left, but also at the same time embracing digital, agile, um, DevOps and things like that. So we have to be able to live in both worlds at the same time. And that, it is quite tricky. Uh, hopefully that ratio of old world and new world will rapidly change over the next few years. We might still have old ways of working and legacy for years to come, but hopefully the bulk of what we are doing will be around digital and DevOps and shift left and all those kind of nice things. So this is a very interesting slide that I got from the Tricenters website and I've got the URL at the, the bottom of the screen there. So at the left, you see the typical picture you see when people talk about evolution, not everyone believes they, there was evolution or not. It doesn't really matter. The point is, just look at that picture. It started with a little monkey and eventually you get this humanoid figure and then a human being walking up straight. And then look at the, the graph or, or the image on the right-hand side that talks about artificial intelligence. It's almost in a way the same thing, this little, and, and maybe let's not talk about monkeys, think about children. You start off crawling and eventually you start falling over yourself and then you start walking and then you can start running and then you never even think about walking into something that's natural. 
So, so look at that um, graphic on the screen right now from the left. They talk about classical testing of the old ways that we were working with. Testing would take years or months. A lot of us are too familiar with these kind of projects from the past, and a lot of us are still working like this. This has to fall away. We have to produce new services to our clients and new products much more quickly. So we can't wait for three years later to start, finally start testing to see if the thing is working. But then customer demand was a long time ago moved on already. Then the next step is agile. And just quickly on that, and I think a lot of you will know what I mean. A lot of companies, a lot of the teams you're working in will say we are agile, but they're not agile at all. And an interesting thing that I heard recently from someone is ask the question, are you really agile? And then you have to start talking about um, how to practice proper agile with all the rituals and things like that. Or have you just introduced some sort of agility? Um, I've seen teams where they talk all the agile talk and they might have scrums and Kanban boards and who knows what, but they're not all together responsible for quality. They're not all responsible for delivering this product. They don't work with user stories. They don't work with BDD and things like that. So you might work for an organization that talks a lot about agile and agility, but from a true sense of the word, agile doesn't necessarily really exist there. And more importantly, remember that the role of a software tester or quality engineer has changed rapidly in the world of agile. No longer isolated, no longer without a voice, no longer right at the end. We are part of the team where the whole team is responsible for quality. We're part of a team where we need to, to let our voices be heard when it comes to architecture and what the business is planning to do all the way through to delivery to the customer, making sure it's secure, it works fast enough, and it, it meets and beats customer expectation. Then I talk about this day of chasm, which is something when you read this article, they talk a little bit more about, it's almost like a jump we need to take. Remember DevOps has changed our world. If we do it right, even more than the introduction of Agile a few years back, and also our role as software quality engineers in a proper DevOps world and tribes and squads and guilds and all those words that people throw around. We get to this um, continuous testing phase then as we mature, where testing is now suddenly no longer years and months or months and weeks, but literally weeks and days. Now, when it comes to continuous integration, continuous delivery and continuous testing, again, there's a lot of people talking the talk, but they don't necessarily know what they're doing. And also a lot of us might want to embrace this technology, this way of working, continuous testing, continuous integration, continuous delivery, working fast, working on small iterations, responding quickly, failing fast learning. Often the great organization we're working for and the way that organization is working, especially from an end-to-end -end SDLC point of view, is prohibiting us from really implementing something like this. So hopefully the greater organization will change as well. And as you know, you can't do continuous testing if from an architecture and a dev point of view all and business, everyone is not aligned and working together. So uh, my experience is that if you look at this graph, a lot of us are most likely still working in the very left, classical testing where it takes years and months. A lot of us started embracing Agile when we work, we deliver in, in months and weeks. I'd like to think most of us are there already. When it comes to CI and, and continuous testing and the likes, I think, I don't know the, the specific numbers, but I would assume, or I'd be surprised if more than 10% of us are really working in, in an organization where we can deliver um, products and services like that. And then the next jump to the right is what we, we are going and what this talk is about. When it comes to testing that takes only days and minutes, we're talking about robotics, Internet of Things, predictive analytics, machine learning, and the like. So let's just think of a practical example. Through AI and testing, and through the likes of predictive analytics, imagine we, and this is the business case really, because remember what we're doing is a means to an end. We're serving a business with business goals. Your business stakeholders can't care about, necessarily care about your frameworks and tools and methodology. They want to be able to deliver services and products to their clients. They want to beat their competition. They want to bring their costs down. And if your techie talk and testing talk and the way you work can't deliver that, then what we're doing is in vain, to be honest with you. So remember that. Always wear a business hat as well as a techie testing kind of a hat. So imagine through predictive analytics and AI, machine learning and the likes, 
let's use an example. Say you have a big system where you have 100,000 test cases. So you can imagine the complexity and the amount of man hours to, to the, deliver testing and to go through those test cases, even if you've already automated a lot of it. But imagine through predictive analytics, you can bring those test cases down to only 10,000. You drop it with 90%. So through that technology, you realize which are the test cases we really have to focus on. And you not only bring your amount of test cases down with 90%, but at the same time, you bring your coverage up with three or four times more. The business case is right there. You're testing much quicker, you're testing the right things, and you are covering, or your coverage is so much higher. We will only get there if we really embrace AI in our testing world, machine learning and things like that. All right, what I want to do next is just to give you some um, sources that I want to encourage you to go look up um, on the internet. I've already spoken about the World Quality Report. Over the years, I've all, always read um, this report from Capgemini Sujeti. Um, they are often so spot on, on trends uh, and what's happening in our market. So uh, I, that's firstly one of the, the resources you always have to have on hand as a test engineer, make sure you are familiar with what they're saying, with what they're finding in the world and some of their recommendations they're making. The next one is also a book by Sujeti called Testing in a Digital Age. This book was published in the last two or three months. Um, some of the names that I'll show you toward the end of this, the, the deck are some of the authors of this book. Now, in my research, even though there are hundreds of books on AI, when it comes to AI and testing, this is the only book I could find. There's maybe two or three more in the meanwhile, but if you, if there's one book that, you, that I encourage you to read over the next few months, it's this book. I think it's about $12 or so. It's not very expensive. Uh, just a table of contents is about seven or eight pages. They really talk through so many practical things. So reading this book, I mean, I'm not affiliated with them. I've got no reason to market them, but it's a great resource. It'll get you familiar with the, the talk terminology around AI and testing, excuse me, and they will also guide you on how to embark on this journey. And it's one of the slides I'm going to touch on just now. So I really want to encourage you to look at that. Another book by Andrew Burgess, the book you see on your right-hand side, The Executive Guide to Artificial Intelligence. What I loved about this book, it's not a technical book at all. This is a book for business executives. And again, remember what I said just now, always wear your business hat as well as your techie testing kind of hat. I found this book extremely helpful when it comes to the business case behind artificial intelligence and what businesses should do to embrace AI, to find the place in your business that makes the most sense to start on an AI journey. Don't just do it because you went to a garden, a conference, or a who knows what, or you read a book and are excited and you want to get going. Make sure you start with small baby steps in the right place in your organization where you can prove value quickly and you can get funding for further um, AI initiatives. So I'm going to just uh, unpack these three resources a little bit more, and then I'll go on to the rest of my presentation. So the World Quality Report, I'm not going to read the whole screen to you. I had these um, slides full of text. Um, years ago, I went on training on presenting, and then the guy said, your slide should never contain more than 14 words. So um, a lot of us will put our talking points on the slide in case we forget to what we wanted to say. So I hate these slides that's so busy. But sometimes you do need a lot of words on it to, to kind of get your point across. But just um, maybe read through this. I'm sure these slides and the recordings will be available in the coming days as well. Look at what I've highlighted. They talk about intelligence-driven QA. Google that term because that talks to a lot of the things I'm talking about today. Intelligence-driven quality assurance. They talk about tools. Tools is a big question when it comes to new technologies. A lot of us work in organizations where we're still using legacy, old kind of testing tools. It's a tool that was bought years ago and we locked into a contract and we, it's difficult to get out of it. We might be working for organizations that's scared of embracing um, new tools. Um, that's maybe scared to ring fence a kind of an environment or an area where we can bring in all these things. I call it the the fruits, fruits and vegetables, the cucumbers and the who knows what of the world, or a lot of other tools that's popping up. There's a lot of small little niche vendors out there producing such exciting um, tools and technology around AI and testing. 
But if your organization is affiliated with a big name like an IBM or an Accenture um, or an Oracle, and there's relevance to all the organizations I just mentioned, I, I don't have an opinion about it um, for the sake of this talk, but you might find that one of the inhibiting factors to embrace this AI journey is that you work in an organization that is locked into this one big vendor contract. And you might not have the freedom to start experimenting with other kind of tools, especially as it relates to AI and testing. Um, they talk here about utilization, analyze utilization, and that can talk about many things. But just think of your capacity planning when it comes to uh, executing on testing projects. Imagine you can use um, machine learning and artificial intelligence to help you predict the amount of man hours it will take to deliver a project. The, um, the um, probability of a project landing. Also to help you predict the reuse of tools and test cases and assets and things like that. So that you can more scientifically and more accurately plan your utilization from a technology and from a people point of view. And yeah, they mentioned something I mentioned a little bit early, uh, earlier at the bottom there, talk about the more repetitive analysis and execution tasks and routine jobs. A lot of testers can sum up what they're doing with that phrase. If that's what you're doing, I would start looking for another job or I'd start upskilling very soon. Because not even AI, just robotics, which is kind of the, the first baby steps of our AI journey, will replace everything you're doing if it's just manual and repetitive. So make sure that you upskill yourself and that you are at a point where, remember the cobotics I spoke about, where you can use the likes of robotics to automate some of your processes. Um, and to take a lot of that manual tasks away to really set you free to do more strategic work. So that's the World Quality Report. Just briefly moving on again, back to the suggested book testing in the digital age. Uh, I'm gonna run through this one. Look at the highlights, connected ecosystems. Testing for experience, I touched on that. What are we testing? We are testing customer experience. The tools and technologies and frameworks are secondary to that. Um, they talk about artifacts. A lot of us have problems with this. We don't have reusable artifacts. We don't have the right kind of data. So it's a big question for us embracing on this journey. Do we have the right kind of data? Do we have the right kind of artifacts to embrace an AI journey? Can we use the likes of uh, robotics to manufacture test data? Interesting topics to debate and to talk about. Looking at the bottom, they talk about an AI quality engineer. It's maybe the first time you've heard that. I imagine this is a new term. Look, a lot of us know uh, ESTED by now, that Microsoft term, Software Development Engineering Test. That was kind of quite a, a vibey, hype kind of a term, maybe still is. But imagine you see an advert in the newspaper, or well, newspaper, I was that for digital, <laughs> on LinkedIn, or on the internet, for an AI quality engineer. Will you be able to apply for that job? What does it even mean to be an AI quality engineer? What kind, is there a certification? I doubt it. Uh, what kind of training, self-training do you need to do? What kind of experience? Really something worth thinking about. Maybe in five years from now, those will be the only testing jobs out there. Um, and they again, then talk about digital test engineering. All right, then just look back to this Andrew Burgess book. This is really not going to do the book justice, but there's one graph in his book that I've got on the screen here. And if you look at it from the left to the right, they talk about this, or he, Andrew talks about this AI journey. Um, and again, you can't just jump into AI and think you've landed there. It's not just some silver bullet and vendors typically would want to sell you that. Remember years ago when we all started embracing uh, automation, test automation, a lot of tool vendors sold it as a silver bullet and, and we spent millions of dollars on these tools. And years later, some of us are still struggling to properly use those tools for test automation. So don't let anyone fool you in thinking there's a quick way and a cheap way into embracing AI and robotics and cognition as it relates to any technology and particularly testing. So it, the first kind of step in um, this journey is to capture information. Image recognition, a lot of you might be gamers, you know, uh, the likes of NVIDIA and others who are um, um, graphic card chip manufacturers. Well, they are big players in the world of AI right now. So image recognition is one of the biggest parts of, of um, the AI world that is working at the moment, you know, to, so it's facial recognition, which, uh, which opens a can of worms when it comes to privacy. But imagine your, your, one of your top banking clients walk into the branch and through facial recognition, you, you, um, 
the contact or the system contacts the branch manager and he or she walks out and greets this client as they walk into the door. So there's a lot of pros and cons. There's a lot of pros around terrorism, finding terrorists, a lot of fears, relevant fears around privacy and things like that. But so image recognition is, is a big part of it. Just do a Google image search. I mean, if you if you if you scan in, if you do reverse image searching, scan in or, or, or upload an image of a dog, they find other dogs so quickly. So, so that's one of the first parts you can do. It might not necessarily be relevant to to where you work, although when it comes to barcode scanning and ID card scanning, that's possibly where I, I can play a role. Speech recognition and and something that you'll see in the next step: natural language processing or understanding is massive. A lot of call centers are already using it. If you're using Siri. Uh, if you're using Alexa, that's natural language processing. Um, I don't know if many of you remember years back, there was a, a software product called Dragon Dictate. So if you wanted to dictate words or speak essentially in the computer as typing, it was exciting because there was nothing like it. But what frustrated me, it took hours and hours, if not days, to train the system. I don't know if you remember those of you who use it. You have to read these paragraphs over and over. And it, it was such a mission to get going. Today, I mean, one of the best things that I use personally when I plan my books and my talks is Google Docs. They have an incredible voice recognition uh, technology built in there. Now, I mean, I've got a very particular accent being South African. Um, and again, whether you're male or female or, or whatever your accent or your age is, there's so many factors that impact the way we speak. There could be cultural nuances, um, you know, specific nuances around our terminologies. I encourage you, if you haven't done it already, go play around with the voice recognition and the voice dictation in Google Docs. It is absolutely incredible how far technology has advanced from the days of Dragon Dictate. Um, I'm not going to stand still a bit more, but what you see, they're moving, uh, where Andrew Burgess in his book talks about capturing information to understanding what is happening and then why it is happening. That's essentially in a very kind of high level um, description the journey you need to undertake from an AI point of view. But I really encourage you to also get your hand on this book, especially from a business point of view, and to maybe put this book in the hands of some of your execs so they can understand the place of AI from a business case point of view in your organization. Um, just quickly, I want to talk to you about some terminology around AI. There, if you, there's, um, I think even on Wikipedia, but there are some websites, if you search for artificial intelligence terminology. Um, for, there's a, a website I discovered about three weeks ago that had 412 terms relevant to AI. So there's a lot of um, uh, kind of lingo and terminology being thrown around. Make sure you're familiar with uh, the basics so you know what people are talking about. Now, I mentioned this already, robotics, or robotic processing, um, automation. That is something that hopefully most of the organizations you're working for have already embraced somewhere or another. Again, it is ideal for repetitive back office kind of tasks. Some people talk about AI, but when you listen carefully, they're talking about robotics. Remember, robotics will do what you tell it to do. It doesn't think for itself. It doesn't learn by itself. It doesn't um, um, kind of upskill itself almost if you would. It's just like a dead robot doing whatever you said. It could be a robot in your kitchen pouring milk for you every morning when you make coffee. It doesn't have the brains to go milk the cow or to change to skinny milk or skim milk or something like that. It's just, it's really dumb, but it's still better and quicker than, than humans. We spoke about natural language processing, so go read up on that. Machine learning is the same. What I really want to get to is what you see on your right. When we talk about artificial intelligence today, we really are talking about this first point, artificial narrow intelligence. What we are saying here is that it's artificial intelligence that can't quite do what humans can do just now. You will see some, you know, you heard about the, the IBM Watson or other systems playing chess against world champions and, and beating them or playing Go, that, that Chinese game. I mean, it's impressive. It's not necessarily smarter than human beings. So AI right now, this is where we are. It's narrow. It's limited. We will very quickly in the next short few years get to the next um, step in AI, which is general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, where AI systems are as smart as human beings are. Now, how smart are human beings? That is a <laughs> debatable concept. Like somebody said the other day, before you get to artificial intelligence, make sure there are some intelligence involved. 
But this is a system that can think as quick as any human being or a combined team of human beings. And an interesting topic to read about is artificial intuition. So human beings have intuition. Often our intuition is wrong. We, our intuition comes up because of some filters, some fear, some accident we had in the past. So for instance, you were in a car accident. So every time someone drives past you quickly or, or makes a noise in their car, you, you get a fight. So it's just human behavior. It's based on past experiences. But how often have we not been right in our intuition when you thought I should turn left or not right? Um, or your intuition when it comes to judging uh, new people that you meet. So imagine we can get AI to not only self-learn, but to actually have intuition. If for those of you interested in spirituality, which I won't touch on right now, but AI as it impacts spirituality and religion is a fascinating topic to, to read about. Um, will we get to a point where we have artificial consciousness? Some say we will, some say we won't. <laughs> Fascinating, go read the different parts of the, the argument. And then in the next few years, well, some academics say 30 years from now, some say 50 years, most kind of say before the turn of the century, we will get to artificial superintelligence. This is where an AI agent is smarter than any human being or group of human beings combined. If you take all the brain power on planet Earth, AI, this AI system is smarter than that. Um, and that then leads me to the next screen, which is this book by Nick Bostrom. Many of you might have heard of it. I really don't be fooled by the owl on the cover, which is a fascinating book. In fact, it's one of the most difficult books I've ever read. It's, it's a very technical book. It's a very well thought through book. It's quite philosophical. It's definitely not one Sunday afternoon with a glass of whiskey and a cigarette kind of relaxing book. I struggled to get to this book, but it was so good. Now look at this quote that I've got on the screen here. In, and this is part of his introduction. In this book, I try to understand the challenges presented by the prospect of superintelligence and how we might best respond. This is quite possibly the most important and most daunting challenge humanity has ever faced. And whether we succeed or fail, it is probably the last challenge we will ever face. Let those words sing again, go read it a few times. But uh, if you have the appetite for it, go and find your uh, find this book, put your, get your hands on it. Go and look at Nick Bostrom's YouTube channel and some of his, his uh, documents that he's producing on his blog. Uh, he's quite a young guy in his early 40s, I think. He's a professor at Oxford, but he's one of those guys that's smarter than any, any human being should ever be. In this book, he talks a lot of, about a lot of interesting things, especially ethical things. So, for instance, he talks about designer babies. Can we, through utilizing artificial intelligence, take the DNA of a father and of a mother and reconstruct it. So we can determine because of the genetical heritage that you inherit as a child through your father's bloodline and your mother's bloodline, there are certain medical conditions that are possibly passed down to you, heart problems and, and who knows what. Imagine through artificial intelligence, we can re-engineer that fetus to not have those sicknesses. Or we can have designer babies. We want babies with blue eyes or brown eyes or that's tall or not. You can imagine the can of worms that's open from an ethical point of view. In the future, with a super intelligence, we will be able to do this. He also talks about warfare, where super intelligence can take over, um, where they can launch nuclear missiles and things like that. So not that the whole book is scaremongering, um, but I think he really sketches a, a picture of the future that some of us, maybe most of us, will still experience in our lifetime of where this thing of AI super intelligence is going. So get your hands on the books that I've um, showed you in this presentation. I really believe it'll help you upskilling yourself and getting your heads around AI. Just very briefly, remember to always distinguish between these two concepts. As we work for... Hello. Hi. Five minutes. Hello. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so much to go through. I'm going to rush now, guys. Um, are we testing AI systems or are we using AI to test? I think a lot of us will most likely start off testing AI systems. We work for organizations that are introducing some sort of AI and they might come to us and say, will you help us test it? Something to think about. The more complex one is using artificial intelligence to test. Just remember the distinction and go read up on that a little bit. Now, if you really want to throw something uh, into the, the fight here is can we use AI to test AI? Something that's, that's worth um, debating. Again, back to the Sergei book, and I'm going to just go through the slide briefly, but hopefully you will have access to this recording and, and these slides later on. 
What I find in this book um, is that they are, they are very practical. It's not just theoretical. They, they really actually can point you in the right direction. So they talk about these five hops when it comes to embracing an AI journey. Um, and you know, AI algorithms automate everything, uh, modeling, uh, making testing easy and faster, test engineers as technology forecasters. I'm just going through this very quickly, but each of these, this is just a paragraph summary, but each of these uh, points in their book span over a number of pages. So it really gives you a place to start to emb embrace this AI journey. Um, these are the slides I wanted to get to. Um, and again, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. These are people that are either working with me on the book that I mentioned at the beginning or people that I've had on my podcast um, or I have met at conferences. Um, but take these names down, find them on LinkedIn or on Twitter and, and make um, contact with them. As I said, you'll be surprised at how many of these people will be happy to chat with you. These are people who are practitioners when it comes to software testing and artificial intelligence. And then just the second screen, a few more names. Uh, some of these names you might know, some of them are very um, famous in the world of testing. Um, and I, I just wanna ask you, I, I really would love to show the video, which is about six minutes long. Would I still have time for that? I guess yes, so. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Now, this is a video I got from YouTube, the URL is at the bottom there. Um, it's about, I just found this was such an inspirational wake-up call for me. Um, but find it on YouTube and, and show it to your teams as well. But I really want to end off my talk with this video. I have not even scratched the surface of the topic of AI and testing. But as I said in the beginning, if I, just, if I could make you realize it's a big thing, we need to embrace it, we need to upskill ourselves. And through the books I've showed you, and to the people I've showed you, if, if hopefully that'll enable you to um, embrace this journey. So I'm gonna press play, and I trust that the audio will come through as well. Anna, you must just let me know if the, if the talking and the audio doesn't uh, come through on this um, webinar. Okay, here we go. No, there is no audio. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. That's a pity. Um, and if you don't mind, in fact, what I'll do on Slack, I'll just copy and paste this uh, URL for you. And if, if you could share it with the, the greater audience, it's such a good video. But if you can't hear what the guy is saying, it's, it's a pity. Um, so let me send you, when we're done, yeah, I'll send you that URL. And then if people can go and have a look at it. And, and then that's really the, the end of, the, um, of my talk. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's a pity I have to rush. I can do a day or two on, on this topic, but it's at least the start, Anna. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much, Johan. I think we're going to continue with the series of your talks because you got, you got me hooked. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's uh, end the recording here, and we're going to move to Slack. We still okay. have uh, about 15 minutes or so continue the conversation and ask the question from Johan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.